In October 2005, my wife Christine and I were sitting in a corridor in a doctor's clinic in Houston, Texas. We were pregnant with our first child and we were waiting for an ultrasound to determine whether or not our child was still alive or had died. Christine and I are capital defence attorneys. We both work for the Louisiana Capital Assistance Centre in New Orleans. We were in Houston as refugees because of Hurricane Katrina. We were sleeping on a mattress in the floor in a house with no electricity except a, an extension cord passed through from the window of the house next door. And we couldn't do our regular work, so we'd taken on the representation of a client on death row in Texas whose execution was scheduled in only a few weeks. We were working day and night on Danny's case, trying to find a way to turn back that execution date and to stop the state of Texas from killing him. But as hard as we were working, the state of Texas was pushing back just as hard to make sure that they could kill Danny. Christine had been the passenger in a car that had been involved in an accident and was experiencing cramping and bleeding. So we found ourselves in this corridor, in this doctor's clinic, waiting 25 minutes for an ultrasound. And as I waited there for this very long 25 minutes, I was struck by our powerlessness. Our unborn child was either alive or dead, and there was nothing we could do about it. In our work, we work tirelessly, we leave no stone unturned, we do everything we can to try and save our clients' lives. But now that it was our child, there was nothing we could do except wait. A client, Danny, on the other hand, was definitely alive and we were fighting very, very hard to try to save his life. In the end, we weren't successful. I went and visited with Danny a couple of hours before they executed him. It's part of the Texas execution protocol, a last visit with one's lawyer. And even then, there was hope. We still had, it, still had an appeal pending before the United States Supreme Court, and while there wasn't much of a chance, there was a chance that the court might agree to hear his appeal. Shortly after I left that meeting with Danny, I received a call from the court, from the death clerk of the United States Supreme Court, and yes, that is a real job. And the death clerk told me that the justices had decided not to consider Danny's appeal. And he asked me, should the court expect any more filings, any last minute appeals, anything else? And I had to tell him no. There was nothing more we could do. They would kill Danny. I was asked by a reporter a while ago about the guilt one must feel when one's client is executed. I thought she was mad. I I didn't kill them. I don't feel any guilt. I did everything I could to stop them being killed. I told anyone who would listen not to kill them. It takes me back to that corridor in the doctor's clinic as we sat there with nothing we could do one way or the other to save our child's life. Danny was still very much alive and his life could easily have been saved. Not by us, but the state of Texas, its populace, its politicians, the people who made up its criminal justice system, they could have saved Danny's life easily simply by choosing not to kill him. A couple of years earlier, I had witnessed the execution of one of my clients in Texas. As I watched them kill Jackie, I stood next to his sister and his 18-month-old son. Jackie's son had been two years old when Jackie got locked up. I wasn't yet licensed to practice in Texas, but was working 20 hours a day alongside a volunteer from Reprieve Australia, working day and night, digging up new evidence, drafting legal pleadings, spending time with Jackie and his family. We raised money to fly his son back to Texas so he could visit with his father. But when they visited, the state of Texas wouldn't allow them to have a contact visit. They had to speak on a phone, reaching out to touch the plexiglass that was between them. It wasn't until we went to Jackie's funeral that his son was able to reach out and touch his father for the first time in so very long. 
Jackie's execution was a horrible event. There's a lot of high talk about the death penalty and hang them high, that sort of thing, but there's a big difference between talk and taking a defenceless prisoner and killing them. Whether done with bloodthirsty relish or with professional indifference, the carrying out of an execution is a wholly repugnant spectacle. But Jackie didn't curse his executioners or rail against them, he just turned his head to the side and mouthed the words, I love you, to his son. A while later, I was back in Australia visiting my father. Uh, my dad had been a doctor throughout his professional life, working in an old-style community-based medical clinic, and he was worried about me. He was worried about the toll of the work, and particularly having witnessed this execution. And I said to him, don't worry, I'm, I'm OK. And I said, besides, Dad, you've seen hundreds of your patients die. No, I should say it's not that Dad was that bad a doctor. <laughs> He'd been doing it for a long time and he had a lot of old clients and terminally ill clients. But, but when I said that to him, he had this visible, visceral reaction. And he said in the most emphatic tones, there is no comparison between watching the natural end of a human life and watching an otherwise healthy person be strapped to a table and killed. And of course, he was quite correct. We all die, but the choice to kill transforms that event into something different, something much darker. One of the great things, though, about doing death penalty work is that it's not all dark. You also get to meet people who choose not to kill, and that also is transformative. Several years ago, I was helping on a case, a, a triple homicide, with a fourth victim who'd survived only because he'd played dead. And it was a drug thing, and I, I didn't know Chuck at the time of the crime, but when I came to meet him, he was a kind and remorseful and spiritual man. And we were trying to negotiate a plea in Chuck's case that would spare him the death penalty, result in a penalty less than death. And the key to it was having the victim's families agree to a sentence less than death. We got to a point where all of the families but one had agreed. And the one was the mother of the youngest victim, a 17-year-old girl whose last words were, please don't shoot me, I'm pregnant. And her mother felt that she owed it to her daughter to push for the harshest penalty available. We had a member of the defence team talking to her and discussing this with her. And to help her understand who Chuck was, we filmed a video of him introducing himself and apologising for what had happened. She watched the video and she agreed to meet Chuck. They met in a room at the local jail, just the two of them, no guards, no lawyers, no rules about what she could ask him or what questions he would answer or what he would say. And when the door opened at the end of the visit, she hugged him. She said, I'm going to fight for you, Chuck. And when we went to court for Chuck's plea and sentence, she was there. And she stood up and she addressed the court and she spoke about her daughter. And she spoke about her loss and she spoke about her pain. But she also spoke about Chuck and her desire that he not receive the death penalty. It was a moment of unparalleled dignity and beauty. I, I really don't have the words to describe what it was like to be there in that courtroom and watch this woman who had suffered so much pain lay that down and choose to spare Chuck's life. I sat in the public gallery with tears streaming down my face. It was a moment for me that had been foreshadowed in a case earlier, a year or so earlier in Florida. We were in jury selection. It's a very important part of a death penalty case because apart from anything else, the jury decides uh, whether to vote to have your client killed or not. In American death penalty cases, jury selection is a bizarre and dispiriting process. You can't serve on the jury 
unless you say that you would be willing to sentence the defendant to death. If you say you would not choose the death penalty, you are sent home as unfit to serve. And so you sit in a courtroom full of prospective jurors and juror after juror gets the microphone and looks across the courtroom at your client and says to the judge, yes, I'd be willing, I'd be willing to vote to kill him. And as we did this on what was a very long day, people were becoming more restive and the pro-death jurors were starting to mock those few jurors who expressed opposition to the death penalty. And the microphone made its way over to the side of the courtroom where this a small, unassuming looking man was sitting. And he told the judge that for personal reasons, he could never vote for the death penalty. And it was, there was a lot of mumbling and murmuring in the courtroom, but he spoke with such a quiet dignity that everyone quietened down and listened to what he had to say. And what he told us was that a friend of his had suffered through the murder of her husband and he had supported her in her grief. And ultimately, she had chosen not to seek the death penalty for her husband's killer. And what he said was that when he saw how that liberated her soul, he could never vote for death. And he quietly handed back the microphone and sat down. And for a time in that courtroom, those pro-death voices were cowed in the wake of what he'd said. My father died about 18 months ago. I was fortunate enough to be able to get back to Australia, to be with him at the end and was with him until the very end. And in that final day, uh, as his breathing became more uncomfortable, he was given a very small dose of a sedative, midazolam, just to make him more comfortable. After the funeral, I returned to the United States and a few days later, the state of Florida executed a man in part by giving him a massive overdose of midazolam, the drug my father had been given as part of his palliative care. People are still choosing to kill, sometimes even choosing to kill with drugs invented to save lives and ease suffering. Chuck lived, my father died, Jackie and Danny died, my daughter survived. Doing this work, I've learned something that I thought that I already knew. We are all going to die, and we have no choice about that. But we do get to choose whether to kill or not. And it's wrong to kill people. Thank you very much. <laughs>